Welcome back to The Black Table on the Black Star Network. This is our hour, our weekly hour, devoted to exploring ideas and subjects of special importance to people of African descent and others fighting to build a better society. So today we're going to take up not only the subject of the United States Supreme Court and U.S. society more generally, but we're going to take that subject up through the prism of someone who needs no introduction to many in the domestic U.S. audience, and that is Clarence Thomas the enigma of Clarence Thomas, in fact. And uh, what is Clarence Thomas about? Who is he? Where did he come from? And how are his opinions increasingly shaping the direction, not only of the United States Supreme Court, but perhaps even of the larger polity? And to help us with that, in fact, to lead us in that conversation today is Professor Corey Robin. Professor Robin has written a remarkable book entitled The Enigma of Clarence Thomas. And I encourage everyone to get this book, to digest this book, and as you're reading it, to refer back to conversations that Professor Robin has had widely, including the one we're gonna to have today. He's a distinguished professor of political science at Brooklyn College and the City University of New York Graduate Center. Uh, he's the author of a number of works, including several books, uh, probably more widely known, his book, Fear, the History of a Political Idea, and his book, The Reactionary Mind, Conservatism, from Edmund Burke to Sarah Palin. He's won a number of awards. He studied, taught, and published across the range of political theorists from Hobbes and Montesquieu to Arendt and Hayek and so many others, Tocqueville. And in this book, he adds Du Bois, Frederick Douglass, Martin Robeson Delaney, and so many others, including contemporary scholars like Cedric Johnson, the Field Sisters, and, and so many others. He's won a number of awards from the American Political Science Association. Uh, he's been a fellow, uh, among others, he's been a fellow at the Russell Sage Foundation, the American Council of Learning, societies and the Princeton Center for Human Values. Without further ado, I'm sure he probably would have said keep all that short, but it's important to know who we're in conversation with today. Joining us at the Black Table today is Professor Corey Robin. Welcome, Prof. Thank you very much. Really happy to be here. Yeah, pleasure, the, pleasure, the pleasure is ours. The pleasure is ours, brother. We, um, we really have been anticipating this conversation for quite some time. This is a book, uh, to our understanding, as you write in the epilogue of the book, that you hadn't set out to write, huh? Could you? But before we get to the, how you came to this book, let's talk a little bit about your, your overarching project. You're a political theorist by training and teaching, huh? Tell us a little bit about your interests and how you frame this, this uh, human, human project in terms of politics. What, 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 what are some of the ways that you kind of line out political theory? Well, I'm, I'm on the left, but I've always been interested in the right and the forces of reaction, counter-revolution and conservatism, um, the broad front of reaction. Uh, and that goes back to my, my first book, which you mentioned in, in the introduction. Um, but when I finished my second book on the reactionary mind, I really thought I was done with the right and I, I, I wasn't uh, going to be interested in it anymore. And, you know, the world had other things in mind, uh, you know, for me. And um, so I, I came to this project a, a little bit um, unwillingly. Um, somebody had asked me to write an article for an anthology uh, on Clarence Thomas. I mean, the anthology was on African-American political thought more generally, but they, they wanted a chapter on Thomas and nobody wanted to do it. Um, so I, you know, <laughs> I sort of got stuck with it. And uh, like I said, I, I wasn't into it because I wasn't really interested in the right anymore. But once I started reading about this guy, um, about whom I think I had most of the, the usual stereotypes that people have about Clarence Thomas, um, it, it really broke things open for me. And I felt like there was a much bigger story here that had to be told. And that's how I came to the book. Wow. I mean, I tell you, man, and, and I say this, and I bought the book sh shortly after it came out. And as I said, before we started talking for, for the recording, um, I teach a class at Howard Law School and I just carried the book in the class with me. I'm like, do you understand how closely Clarence Thomas's ideas, his upbringing and formation mirror that of so many black people in this country? And there's virtually nothing that I'm aware of that approaches Thomas's judicial philosophy, his politics through the lens that you do. In fact, you, you say, what is it that Clarence Thomas's life and, and work somehow is the story of the last half century of American politics, including our many defeats, some of our triumphs, but ultimately kind of traces it out. And, and finally, as someone who is a, you know, probably would be characterized as a black nationalist, certainly a black internationalist, and, and you write that he doesn't really have much interest in black internationalism, 
you say, well, I didn't set out to, to frame him as a black nationalist necessarily the way we would talk about black nationalism, but I'm looking at the overlap of conservatism and black nationalism. But Prof, you call Clarence Thomas a black nationalist, man. <laughs> Help us understand that. This is the thesis of this book. Could you talk a little bit about what is the thesis of the enigma of Clarence Thomas? Sure. Well, it, it starts with who he was as a younger man. Um, and we and I can get into much more detail about that, you know, as the show goes on. But for his formative political years, he was a black nationalist. Um, he had come north from the south. He was a student at Holy Cross and he helped found the Black Student Union. He was part of a cohort of black male students who was brought, um, recruited in 1968. And um, and he. Uh, helped form the Black Student Union, as I said, and they had a, a manifesto that he was the, and he was the sec secretary treasurer. And if you look at the, 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 the principles of that manifesto and the principles by which uh, these guys acted, and they were guys because it was still an all-male college, um, they were very much in, in, in concert with a lot of the Black nationalist um, tenets of the late 1960s and the early 1970s. Um, very hostile to um, certain kind of integrationist ideas, um, very much in favor of, uh, of black separatism, um, very much uplift the race uh, kind of uh, philosophy. Very, uh, And they saw themselves as, and, and Thomas in particular saw himself as a race man, um, as very much uh, believing that the fate of black people de depended upon black men. Um, and so, uh, you know, one of his formative influences was Malcolm X. Um, he had a, you know, he memorized um, all the speeches, not all the speeches, but many of the speeches of Malcolm X uh, by, by listening to them on records. That's how people used to pass those around back in the day. Um, and, uh, you know, was just very much steeped in that philosophy, also quite confrontational. He led the big student walkout in his junior year. Um, against uh, General Electric because of their recruiting practices. So it was, you know, it was a, a, a real part of his formation. Um, and, and, and the important thing to say about all this is as he moves to the right in the mid 1970s, what's interesting is how little of this earlier formation he gives up. People have noticed along the way that he was once a black nationalist as a student, but the assumption was, well, he moved to the right and then junked it all. And what I found, the more, you know, that, that's what makes this a story, is how little of that he gave up. And so that's the real thesis of the story is, is, is this marriage, as you say, between kind of black conservatism and black nationalism. And thank you, Prof. And particularly for our younger folks and our students out there, including law students, law professors and others, you are building your analysis uh, with a methodology that had you engage the entire arc of his judicial opinions, huh? I mean, what'd you say by 2018, he's over 700. You actually, you and your, your assistants, you actually went through all of his stuff? Yeah, and, and I should say these opinions are long. They are not short. He, he's known for writing sometimes 100, 200 page long opinions. And what's fascinating about him is how steep they are in black history. Um, you know, not all of them, obviously, but a, a, a quite many of the significant ones um, and steeped in Du Bois and steeped in Frederick Douglass, steeped in the historiography of black history, um, the story of Reconstruction. Um, he, you know, he cites extensively from Herbert Apthecker, who was a, a white historian, but a member of the Communist Party, the pioneering historian of, of, of slave rebellions. So he, you know, it, it is not just... Um, you know, little things he dabbles on here and there. He it, it really drives a lot of the jurisprudence, it, and it's all there on paper uh, for people to read. That is remarkable. I mean, I, I, and you know, and as you, as we said, you you divided it out into a kind of three movement story: race being the first three chapters, and then you pick up chapters four through six in capitalism, and then end up the last three chapters in constitutionalism. But it was fascinating to, to the point you're raising, and that you wrote about in chapter five. You know, for him to go so deeply into uh, civil forfeiture and, and and actually stand against it, one of the few things he does stand against in terms of the power of the state, but to cite extensively Eric Foner and Reconstruction, uh, even more so than Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who ends up on the other side of it. I mean, I think people don't, re as you say, this is really going to be a revelation for folk who think that he changed. He didn't change that much. 
I mean, and, and when you cite, for example, some of his influences, including Louis Farrakhan, the fact that he was a big fan of and is a big fan of Spike Lee movies. I mean, I think some people are going to be shocked by this problem. <laughs> I, I certainly was, you know, when I found, I found this all out. And it's, it's yeah, it's really, really, really interesting. I mean, you talked about the, the civil forfeiture, uh, forfeiture stuff, um, but also, with, you know, with uh, the takings clause, which is a, a provision of the, you know, of the, uh, the Fifth Amendment um, about, you know, the taking of property. And, um, you know, what's fascinating there, you know, he, he has a big case coming out of New Haven and he talks about um, urban renewal is black renewal, which was, you know, a, a kind of, um, uh, I'm sorry, urban renewal is black removal, yes, uh, right. which was, you know, a, a, a big slogan and, that and motif. Slogan. That's right. Uh, you know, in, in the black community, James Baldwin made it very famous in an interview he gave with Kenneth Clark. And, you know, this is just kind of part of his language and the idiom in which he uh, speaks. So, again, it's 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 very deep with him. And w the real question, you know, that I think for readers and listeners and, and citizens to grapple with is, you know, th there have been conservative black nationalists before. That's hardly a discovery of this book. And, you know, scholars know about this. I think in popular imagination, it gets short shrift. But, you know, that's not a, an unknown thing. We have not had a conservative black nationalist Supreme Court justice before. That's right. And that's the story that I think we really have to come to terms with because I think it alters our understanding of the Constitution. It alters under understanding of African-American history and its relationship with white supremacy and these white supremacist institutions. It's it's um, I mean, I call the book The Enigma of Clarence Thomas. Because that, that is the big enigma is how did somebody like this end up you know and the cover shows this you know in this very white institution that's right that's right well prof we're going to pause here for a moment and when we come back we're going to continue this conversation uh with professor corey robin author of the enigma of clarence thomas back in a moment here on the black star network To the Black Table here on the Black Star Network. I'm your host, Greg Carr, joined today by Professor Corey Robin, the author of The Enigma of Clarence Thomas. Uh, Professor Robin, Corey, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned, of course, the whole arc of uh, Kenneth Clark and, you know, the questions of the doll test. I never liked that doll test myself, <laughs> quite frankly, <laughs> but because, it, I mean, what, what it says or doesn't say about the nature of Black identity and self-worth, you explore... Clarence Thomas's formative years and his early professional arc, and you trace out the theme of stigma. Yeah. You trace out this theme of self-respect. I mean, how much, how much of that thinking and that upbringing goes into his judicial philosophy in your mind? I think it's really important. I mean, I, I think it's both the, um, the, 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 the terror and the power of his ideas of race and also, frankly, the limitations of his idea of race mm -hmm. uh, and racism, because it is very much focused on stigma um that is you know 
from a very early age. Um, I mean, and, and it actually starts within the black community. Yes. Um, Clarence Thomas was born in Pinpoint, which is a very poor town on the, the coast of the Atlantic in Georgia, not far from Savannah. When he's about five or six years old, he moves to Savannah where he's uh, to move in with his grandfather, who's a kind of, I mean, you would say today middle class, except, you know, was was, was not from a middle class background himself, was very working class. But nevertheless, he had a he, he owned his own uh, fuel delivery company. He owned some property. And but the thing about Thomas was when he goes to school is he's much darker than other black students. Okay. And this is, you know, by his own memory, this is his first real confrontation with the color line is colorism. Well, Corey, uh, I, I almost I almost hesitate to say this, but again, this is a black table being candid. At 57 years old, I am old enough to remember when in elementary school it was an insult for a quote unquote lighter skinned black child to talk to a black one and call them ABC. I remember America's blackest child, and so Clarence Thomas does too, a generation before us, but yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I mean, and that is, what, as you say, that is what he was called, um, you know, later when he's at a school and he goes to sleep, um, you know, they, 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 they say you can't find Clarence, if, you know, because the lights are out. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a very, um, you know, wounding, painful experience for him. Uh, and he doesn't forget it. And he begins to apply it uh, as he gets older. This is how he begins to understand black liberalism is, you know, it's the professional managerial class that tends to be lighter and wealthier. Uh, and so, you know, th these ideas about color and race are, are very formative for him. Um, and they, they, they come to center on this idea of a stigma, um, that black people are stigmatized. And this is then going to carry, I mean, this is a long story, but just to cut to the chase, it's going to carry over to his ideas about affirmative action. Now, most conservatives, white conservatives, when they talk about affirmative action, they be believe it's an, an offense against colorblindness. And what's interesting about Thomas, even though his white conservative fan base thinks he's a colorblind uh, jurist, he's anything but that. Uh, he, yeah. he's, he's the complete opposite of that. Yeah. And for him, the you know one of the key um, wrongs of affirmative action is how it stigmatizes black people. In the same way that not every black person in the 19th century was enslaved, but nevertheless, all black people carried the stigma of slavery and of, 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 of racialized inferiority, whether they were free or enslaved. Thomas argues that, of course, not all black people are in a university by virtue of affirmative action or in a workplace by affirmative action. Nevertheless, because of racism, they will carry that stigma that they got there. And it's not just a, a stigma of inferiority. It's a stigma of that you could only get where you got to by virtue of white benevolence. Yes. Uh, and this is, you know, very important for his ideas about racial uplift and, and the centrality of black self-help that affirmative action is a an ideological story that uh, that 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 that, that, that pers you know persists with this you know this notion that black people can only get to where they get to if they get anywhere yes. by virtue of white help. Yes, and of course, as you say, on the other side, dignity is so important to him, not just individually but collectively. Although that collective sense of dignity doesn't translate into collective political action as you line out in terms of voting rights, which is fascinating. And, and you get into that second movement when you start dealing with capitalism. In fact, let, let's walk across that bridge a little bit. Um, you know, it was interesting that you line out an opinion where he compares uh, the set aside, the affirmative action kind of concept in the U.S., to apartheid in South Africa, <laughs> he says neither one is good. I mean, they're, they're, they're very, there's something compelling about the idea that if once you accept the rules, you just got to beat these people at their own game. But there's an animation when it comes into the second movement, capitalism, where you kind of in chapter four you begin to talk about Thomas Sowell, yeah. and uh, I think about the fact, of course, Thomas Sowell started out at Howard, and he writes about that in his memoir, and Sterling Brown and others are like, well, go test yourself against these other folks. You know what? What does Clarence Thomas? What would you think Clarence Thomas would have to say to black folk who say, well, we need these programs? I mean, Clarence Thomas, does he think that perhaps this enfeebles the black population to kind of rely on these kind of programs? Yeah, very much so. I mean, I'm, I'm skipping to the third 
part of the book, but just put it quickly, um, you know, Thomas believes that the whole apparatus of modern welfare state liberalism, um, whether it be, you know, the welfare state itself, uh, voting rights, um, and, and other, the sort of the cultural revolution of the 1960s, the sexual revolution, that all of these things have crippled the black community, and in particular, black men. Now, uh, Thomas has a very patriarchal vision of, of racial progress and of racial identification. Um, I should say he's not really alone in this. No. Um, and, uh, you know, he really, I mean, he says it well into this time in the Reagan administration in the mid 1980s in a speech he gives in Savannah at a black college in H, uh, CBU, um, HBCU. Yeah. Me. Ironically, of course, Savannah State right there near his hometown. No question. Yeah. Exactly. And he says, you know, the, 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 uh, I'm getting to get the quote on, but the future or the, or the fate of the black race depends upon the black man. Um, and this is, you know, this is not in his, you know, young undergraduate days. This is when he's, a, you know, a member of, you know, the head of the EEOC in the Reagan administration. Um, and so this is, you know, for him, all of these liberal programs have weakened black men. And um, for him, if you were to say to him, you know, we need these programs, that is a statement of object of destitution so profound and wounding to him uh, that he thinks, you know, you couldn't come up with a greater self-indictment than a statement like that. So he really has this idea of black sovereignty, black male sovereignty, I should say, Hmm. that, you know, the second that it it is extended from the state, the white state, and and I'll explain what I mean by that in one second, um, that that stigma returns and that that kind of wound returns and that it is so crippling and stifling. Now, the reason I say the white state is if black people help each other, particularly if black men help their communities the way his grandfather in his memory did, that's a completely different story. So he's not a rugged individualist. And again, he's misread on this by many, many of his fans and his critics. He is not an individualist. He believes very centrally in the importance of communal support. And I put it in quotations because it's really the black patriarch dispensing his, um, you know, his patronage to the black community. That is his vision. Um, That, you know, he does not believe is crippling. That he believes is empowering. That he believes is, is the path of racial progress. And what's more, he says, you know, this is the story of how black people survived under slavery, under Jim Crow, you know, and it's interesting because I think a lot of the black academic left, you know, uses that word of survival, persistence, you know, the sort of the black melancholic left. This is this is the language of Clarence Thomas as well. Indeed, you know, this is not, you know, an empowered freedom movement. You know, that's you know, in that sense, it is about the persistence of a subjugated, despised minority. Hmm. In the face of, you know, of everything saying you couldn't survive. Yeah, it's interesting, Corey, because it, while that is the language of a lot of the black left and the black academic left and kind of professional managerial class, for Clarence Thomas, that perhaps would be viewed, as you kind of describe, as a top down philosophy. He's coming from the bottom up, so to speak. And so, I mean, there is a class analysis that you get into, particularly when you start dealing with criminal justice and you start talking about uh, issues of incarceration, you know, in your mind, is Thomas, does Thomas perhaps see himself as a representative of the lower classes, the working classes, the poor? Because he does have a sort of contempt, ironically, since he came out of a couple of those institutions right. with a kind of professional managerial class. Could you walk us through some of that? Because he's, yeah. he's at the center of power. But I mean, when I was writing the book, Cedric Johnson, who was a real influence on, on the book's you know inception, and his book was sort of transformative for me, but he read the manuscript and, you know, he really pushed on that class dimension. And it's and it's complicated with Thomas. Um, you know, he is from you can't say the black working class, but he's you know, certainly from a, 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 a black poor. Yeah. Um, and and then is raised by his grandfather, who, you know, was more the black middle class. He has a weird, you know, class background. And then he becomes part of the black, uh, you know, uh, professional managerial class um, once he goes to Holy Cross and onward. Um, and on the one hand, he has real contempt for that black professional managerial class. I don't think he's that strange or rare in that regard. A lot of no. white 
you know, PMCs have good time for other, you know, it's, it's pretty common. And, and um, quietly it has kept prof a lot of black too, but uh, you know, <laughs> let's just be, let's just be frank about, it. I'm sure Cedric said that to you. But anyway. <laughs> um, and so, you know, he, he, there's that kind of contempt and he claims to be speaking in on behalf of, of the authentic black community that is working class, that is poor and, and so on. And yet, um, as, as you pointed out in the book, uh, you know, he, his, con his conception of racial wounds and racial grievances, you know, are very much with this focus on stigma, for instance, they are, they're very much, you know, PMC type concerns, you know, when, when he comes, because when he talks about it, it's, you know, how you get viewed in the, in the seminar room, how you get viewed in the executive boardroom, how you, you know, so it's, it's a very rarefied um, you know, uh, strata and, and, you know, he's not particularly interested, um, in the kind of stigma that gets attached to black working class, uh, men, um, you know, it, you know, in, in, in inner cities, uh, in, you know, high crime areas and so forth. And to the extent that he does talk about that, you know, his answer is, and he's very frank about this actually. I mean, that's the other thing. He doesn't hide any of this. No. He's very upfront. Um, and his answer is, you know, all the more reason why um, if, if you're black and you're male and you're poor and working class and you live in a city, you need to stay the hell away from anything, My God. anything that even will attract, you know, even the, 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 the slightest bit of notice from the police, from the state. All the more reason to stay away. And he claims this is what uh, his grandfather taught him and that, you know, liberalism has blurred that line to the detriment of the black uh, community. Well, we appreciate you, Prof. I'm, I'm sure there are a lot of our viewers right now uh, who had very similar talks in their families. Um, so this is not unfamiliar at all. And it's been really a revelation to so far. Uh, we're gonna take a pause for a moment, Prof. And when we come back, we're gonna continue this conversation here at the Black Table with Professor Corey Robin, author of The Enigma of Clarence Thomas, political theorist, student of political theory. And we'll be back in a moment. Welcome back to The Black Table here on the Black Star Network. I'm your host, Greg Carr, with Professor Corey Robin. Uh, Prof, let, let's look at how Clarence Thomas, his interpretation uh, of the law, you know, with this political philosophy, with this cultural grounding he has, how that translates into how he reads the Constitution. Uh, you write about how at his confirmation, well, first of all, you write about how he never aspired to be on the bench in the first place. And that's a fascinating, I mean, we say a few words about that when he makes the transition from EEOC to the bench. But at his confirmations, people might think that he would be an originalist. But in fact, he talks about the Constitution being uh, a living document. And uh, people have accused him of being a kind of doctrinaire when it comes to natural law. But you write when you go through his opinions, that is in fact not the case. And, and so if he sees black people as being able to pull ourselves up by our bootstraps, so to speak, why doesn't that translate, for example, in his assessment of voting rights and, and constitutional protections? Why doesn't that translate into a philosophy of collective black political action? Why is he so hard on black folk when race seems to be a factor in enhancing black political power instead of uh, the opposite? It's any of those. Sorry, what's that? No, 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 no. Go right ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, this is, you know, in a, in a lot of ways, I think you get into the, the real kind of uh, darkness of, of his worldview. Um, and it's, uh, it's a very conservative one in this regard, which is that the more adversity, the, the harder things are, the more heroic the efforts that will be launched in response to that. Uh, it's a very masculinist view. Yes. Um, it's a very, you know, in some ways it's a kind of very Catholic view. He quotes from Thomas Aquinas, uh, to, you know, to, to justify these kinds of views. But, he, and again, he does it, he's not shy about this. Um, and so for him, uh, the thing about voting rights 
um, I mean, there's a lot of things he has a critique of, of voting rights, but um, is that, again, it, it's, it, it all depends, well, it all depends upon uh, white beneficence. Um, this is a country in which there is a white majority and black people uh, are in the minority. And in fact, he gives this very famous uh, interview to Juan Williams in, in, in the 1980s, Juan Williams, you know, back then when he was at the Atlantic. And he says, you know, let's assume that you could parcel out political power uh, to every group by, by percentages, you know, group rights kind of a, a point of view. He says, you know, who's going to come out to on top and who's going to come out on the bottom? You know, white people are always on top. Black people will always be at the bottom. And the more you depend upon white actors, white benevolence to secure your status. And he says, let's be clear, that's what a lot of these, you know, voting rights gerrymandered decisions are all about. That's why he compares it. Uh, to uh, to racial apartheid is that these are all under the control of white political actors, and that which is given to you, and which you depend on as a gift, can and will be taken away. Corey, that sounds uh, remarkably close to not the same as, but it certainly overlaps with somebody who you say Clarence Thomas actually uh, gives favorable reviews to, and that's Derek Bell. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, in, in 1987, 88, he reviews one of Bell's books in the Wall Street Journal, and it's a remarkably sympathetic view. It's also very, you know, similar to what Marcus Garvey said about about the vote. Absolutely. Um, you know, it's that the state, the political, because it is necessarily by definition, especially in a democracy, uh, it is it, it is the the sphere of white, the white majority. Uh, black people will always, you know, come out on on the bottom and can't depend upon it, and therefore uh, should turn to an, a different sphere altogether. They should give up on politics, not just voting, but protest politics, social movements, community organizing, the whole panoply of of black politics. They should give up on it. and and so again, you know, people read these opinions about you know on on voting rights. He has not been shy about this. No. No and, 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 you know, one of the frustrations I have is that, you know, people think that Clarence Thomas, you know, if he says anything that sounds black nationalist or he quotes Malcolm X, he's somehow lying. This is a guy who's willing to say some of the most horrific things. Yeah. He's not shy about it at all. So <laughs> why would he want to dress it up uh, in any way? It doesn't it doesn't really you know, add up. But he's just, you know, like I said, very, um, very forthright on the question about voting rights and about politics. Uh, and I, you know, I call this white state black market, th this part of the book. Um, and that is why uh, he really turns to the market and has, you know, I think, a, a, you know, a completely a absurd idea about about capitalism and its separations. But again, not unprecedented. Um, you know, I, 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 I was really influenced in, in some of the revisionist historiography on black power movements in the late 60s and early 1970s. A lot of them are experimenting with black capitalism. Oh, it's no question uh, about it. You know, and 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 you know, so he's not that far off from yeah. that whole milieu. And of course, you know, the Nixon administration very cynically uses. That's right. Um, you know, they they take out ads. Black power. Uh, you know, capitalism is black power. That's right. So you know, this is it's a very murky time in the late sixties, early seventies. You know, really after nineteen sixty eight, which was the you know the high point of black success and black political protest. Um, you know, when people are e engaging in these experiments and, you know, just Thomas, he's like any ideologue. He just takes that idea and he runs with it all the way right to the end. Well, let's talk about that some. Uh, Corey, so if the market then is the answer, if capitalism is the answer, at least a step in, the, in that direction of an answer of black power and black self-empowerment, then why does he come out where he does on questions like, for example, disparate impact cases? Um, and why does he not, uh, why in, even in terms of the relationship between speech and money, is yeah. he so laissez-faire when it comes to these kind of corporate interests when folks on the other side would say they're putting their thumb on the scale, Clarence, the state has to intervene. Could you walk us through some of that? If the market is the answer, how does he come down on, on some of these issues the way he does? Yeah, I mean, this is where I think the more, you know, libertarian or you know conservative part of him, he really, you know, kicks in. Huh. Um, I mean, well, let take a step back first. Yeah. You know, uh, I, I mean, I think, first of all, I think he thinks of the economy, 
not as the way he thinks of the state. It's not a completely cohesive, unitary um, thing. It's yeah. it has niches in it and it has spaces. Um, so you look at something like black hairdressers. Um, you know, he looks at all these niches that African Americans over the years have filled and have accumulated some kind of wealth and capital. Um, and he said, you know, and again, this is a very autobiographical story for him. This is the story of his grandfather. Um, you know, black people were, you know, were, were being uh, getting oil, um, you know, fuel. And so his grandfather started off by just delivering wood um, and, you know, filled a niche. And he really thinks that that is the way that capitalism works. And it's also very Booker T. Washington, very yeah. Isaiah Montgomery, very Marcus Garvey, as you say, yeah. even all, as ironically, Washington is kind of surreptitiously funding challenges to Jim Crow laws in the South. His public right. face, this is very consistent, as you say. I mean, and it still resonates in a lot of corners of the black community today. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and you know, and this is the the circles in which he's traveling in the 1970s and the uh, early 1980s, uh, other black conservatives are really, you know, making these kinds of arguments. Um, and, you know, they've been sort of forgotten by the, you know, there was a time in which they, those arguments got a lot of attention in the mainstream media and the white media. Um, and it's all been kind of uh, overshadowed over the years by a lot of other developments. But, you know, these were really, you know, front and center. Um, I mean, I remember in high school, you know, black conservatives, you know, it was really a kind of, um, you know, the Reagan administration had a lot invested in, you know, making sure people saw themselves connected with this. And, so and ironically, in black nationalist communities at that same time, whether it be Floyd McKissick and those guys in North Carolina, uh -huh. City, we talked with Adolph Reed a few weeks ago about that, whether it be the black nationalists, whether it be Ocean Hill, Brownsville and Brooklyn in the East, the African centered uh, education movement. It wasn't just the black conservatives who politically were seen as being aligned with Reagan and, and, and Meese and the big meeting they had in 1980. What was it? Claremont somewhere. No, yeah. it was also the Pan-Africanists and the black nationalists. So it gets real messy. This is why your yeah. book is so important. <laughs> Well, James, James Foreman's book, um, James Foreman's oh, yeah. Junior, um, Locking Up Our Own, you know, really goes into this as well on criminal justice issues. And, you know, he says it's it's not just that African-Americans in, in Washington, D.C., you know, are really pushing for some tough on crime stuff. You know, many of the most vocal, you know, voices on, on behalf of that are, as you say, kind of black nationalist, pan-Africanist voices. So this is a, a, a whole milieu that sees, you know, the function of the state. Um, and, and Thomas, I mean, I should say on, on that particular issue is even more out there than a lot of other black conservatives. You know, they're 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 you know supporting things like enterprise zones. Remember that? That was the yes. thing in the 80s. Absolutely. Um, you know, and he says, you know, the first thing you gotta deal with is crime. Um, you cannot have a black entrepreneurial class. You can't, you know, have um, you know, a black market, as it were. Um, unless you've got crime under control. And if you look at some of his crime decisions, what's yeah. fascinating about them on the court, you know, who are the victims um, of those decisions? It's oftentimes black participants in the market, you know, women, grandmothers who can't go to the corner store because there are gangs on the street, uh, you know, uh, home sales that are not happening in the black community because crime rates are high. You know, it's, it's, he's, he's got a very clear sense of the connection between you know, harsh criminal justice, you know, the penal state and the black market, uh, that the, the penal state creates um, uh, uh, black market actors. And, you know, again, people say, well, how could you be a black nationalist and, you know, support a harsh penal state? Again, as you, you know, we've just been discussing, that's not unprecedented, number one, but he has an analysis of this. That's that, right. you know, this is how you create black, particularly black male market actors. Uh, people who are going to be entrepreneurs, who are going to, you know, create wealth in their communities, but they can't do it without that punishing hand, that harsh, punitive hand. And 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 in a way, if you were to say to him, but that state is racist. I think in his, uh, you know, bleakest, most honest moments, what he would say is, "The more racist, the better." Wow. And I'm uh, like Lenin, man. I mean, in other words, you got to heighten the contradictions until yeah, it's no, I said, he is an ideologue. He wow. takes an idea and carries it all the way through. Um, and so, you know, again, you know, if, if you get nothing from this book, you know, this is not somebody who you can dismiss as a hypocrite or, you know, as 
just kind of stupid or contradictory. That's right. Just give a, sit with that contradiction for a second. Don't just say oh, that's a sign of a, a, of a small mind. Ask yourself in good left radical fashion, what does the contradiction reveal? How is it that one can make sense, a unity of that? And, and once you do that, you'll see that's what he was saying all along. My goodness. My goodness. I'll tell you what, we're going to pause here one final time, uh, Corey. And when we come back, we're going to hit right there, right there, man. I mean, Clarence Thomas's austere worldview, which perhaps many more of us than what we care to admit might share. Uh, we're going to start with that when we come back in a moment here at the Black Table on the Black Star Network. Back in a moment. impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives, and we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network. Welcome back to The Black Table here on the Black Star Network. Greg Carr, your host, joined today by uh, Corey Robin, author of The Enigma of Clarence Thomas. Prof, you walked us right up to the gate, man. Your your epilogue, Clarence Thomas's America. And I only only have about 10 more minutes, so I want us to, you know, get to that. But I, I can't resist asking you about in that last third, in your third movement, when you talk about the white constitution and the black constitution, you know, Clarence Thomas's worldview is one that, you know, in so many ways, many of us find some common kind of cons consensus building. Race, he talked the permanence of race, the fact that we've got to fight our way through this. You know, walk us through those last couple of chapters, eight and nine, if you can, just in the, the Black Constitution and the White Constitution. We start talking about the role of the state, the role of the federal government vis-a-vis -vis the state government and, and state actors. I mean, we don't have time, obviously, for you to go through everything, but could you give us a broader view of how Clarence Thomas looks at the function of the state in trying to address some of these issues and, and what it can and can't do? Sure. Um, the first thing to say, as you said, is Clarence Thomas has two constitutions in mind. One is the Black Constitution. Um, this is the Constitution that's created out of the Civil War, the struggle over emancipation, essentially, with the Reconstruction Amendments. Mm -hmm. And he's very clear that that Constitution revolutionized the relationship between the national and the, and the state governments and empowered the national government, he thinks, mostly for the worse. Mm -hmm. um, and then there is the White Constitution, the, the, the Founders Constitution, the Framers Constitution. And people oftentimes say, how could somebody who's a black nationalist believe in, believe in that original constitution? Well, remember what his, his originating philosophy is. Black people survived an American version of a totalitarianism, and that's what he calls it. That's you know, right. it's this American totalitarianism. If they can survive that, they developed virtues and skills and habits and customs and tactics and strategies that we need to go back to. And he says, you know, people think that I'm anachronistic. I am. I want to go backwards in time wow. in order to move us forward into the future. He's very upfront about this. Man, that's a bizarre and, version of saying Kofa, brother. I'm going to tell you <laughs> right. <laughs> but, but, but it's right there, you're saying. It's in black and white. I got to do his read his opinions. Yeah, exactly. And, um, and so he embraces, um, you know, the kind of constitutional transformations that we're seeing today. Um, there's a whole other story about rights there that we probably don't have to get in uh, time to get into. But, you know, he really wants a kind of punitive state that will force, that will recreate the adversity, the hardship, uh, the subjugation that black people once experienced, not because he is a sadist and not because he is, um, you know, just having a lark, but because he believes out of that experience will come a kind of new generation of powerful black men like his grandfather, um, who will be the salvation of their communities. My goodness. And yeah, you start that. No, 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 uh, no, no, please finish your thought, please. No, I mean, and, and so, you know, with that comes the kind of world that we are increasingly seeing today, where, uh, mm. you know, this is a state that is extraordinarily punitive, but simultaneously cannot protect you. 
certainly if you're black, increasingly if you're white. I mean, just think about things like COVID uh, and just the, the, just the, the general breakdown of the, the state apparatus, uh, climate change. Uh, you know, we are facing these kind of extinction events. And in, in this world, and I say it's a mix of Mad Max and Do the Right Thing, which, as you said, you know, Spike Lee is a favorite of his. Yes. Uh, yeah. You know, what do you have? You have strong men uh, with guns. With guns. Well, in fact, it's interesting that one of the cases you cite when he talks about Second Amendment guarantees and protections is about an elderly black woman. Yeah. That's yeah. fascinating, man. I mean, yeah. she got to protect herself out here in the hood. These guys are coming. We, we, we read very carefully into those footnotes, I can see. Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> any work that you've done deserves that kind of close reading, man. That's why I'm telling everybody you need to go get this book. But go ahead, please. That. Yeah, but, you know, um, uh, it was a case out of San Francisco, actually. Yeah, it was an elderly black woman who had a gun. Um, and, you know, he talks about this, about the centrality of of black arms in the black tradition. Um, yes. His second amendment, you know, decisions, uh, particularly McDonald versus Chicago, which is about 12 years old now or 11 years old, uh, really goes into how central it was arming black people during reconstruction. Um, and he closed- Panthers, black power movement, the Panthers. Yeah. I mean, oh. <laughs> we're talking about black militia, you know, yeah. Republic of New Africa, hey, absolutely. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I mean, there's a, a song, oh God, now I can't remember. It was a song about, uh, uh, that Kathleen, not Kathleen Cleaver, no, uh, Bra Elaine Brown, I think, wrote about, you know, the centrality of black men being armed and, you know, how central that was to the black community. Um, and, and so this is, you know, this is really to the heart of the uh, whole vision. And again, what was once maybe, you know, a vision that was particular to one wing of African-American politics, and again, this is the, the heart of the book, is now a vision that pervades America, that doesn't, not pervades American society, that is American society. That is American society, uh, yeah. And, you know, and that's why I, you know, I, I hope it's not hyperbolic to say, you know, it's Clarence Thomas's America. And as I said in a recent article, he is not only the most powerful black person, you know, government official in the United States, which people seem to forget. Um, he is the most symptomatic public intellectual in the United States. I think he is articulating um, what this country has become and where it is going. And he has seated the federal bench with his clerks, oh, yeah. which you kind of began with, which is, which is remarkable. Let me, and let me ask you, Prof, as we kind of turn to a close, because, you know, it, you don't use, obviously, the word dystopian in terms of his outlook lightly. Um, and, and as you've kind of lined out, and I love how you write this, for Clarence Thomas, repair or writing the ship is, is a non-starter. So in your mind, given the trajectory of where we're headed right now, because Clarence Thomas is clearly the intellectual leader of the court, um, you know, do we just begin again? I mean, what in Clarence Thomas, I mean, what are the prospects for you having done this close reading against the context of your whole arc of, of intellectual work and teaching? You know, what are the possibilities in a country where this, this kind of ideology is ascendant? Yeah, I think the first thing we have to remember is Clarence, we have to start is that Clarence Thomas didn't come from nowhere. Mm -hmm. He came from somewhere, not just literally, but metaphorically. And that there is a reason why this point of view has become ascendant. And it's not because Republicans are crazy and it's not because they're stupid. Um, and it's not even just because they are white supremacists. Yes, sir. Um, what it comes out of, I believe, is the defeat of the black freedom movement in its political phase. And I take the, po the politics of black freedom um, and the politics of the left very seriously, that if you do not believe you can transform society through political means, um, and I, I define that broadly, you know, whether it's voting, whether it's uh, social movements, whether it's pro you know, uh, radical politics, you know, in the broadest sense, if you have given up on that idea, if you believe that you know, melancholia, melancholy and defeat um, is is the past, present, and future? I think it's very hard not to end up on the train uh, of of Clarence Thomas. And so, where do we start? Is by confronting that the not just the 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 ideology of defeat, but the reality of defeat, uh, and then try to restore some belief in the possibilities of politics again, broadly defined. 
Well, I, I think we all, uh, I'm sure everybody watching this would join me in thanking you for undertaking this work, which you hadn't set out to do, but which kind of extends your previous work. And I, I'll ask you one final question. Uh, what you working on, man? I know you have a few projects that I read about that you working on. What, what's next? What's next, <laughs> Professor Rob? I'm trying to write a book about uh, intel intellectuals and capitalism, basically, uh, how mm -hmm. people have thought about capitalism since the 18th century through today. So mm -hmm. um, a little less presentist, um, you know, obviously has you know some implications for today, but um, a little bit getting back, going back to history. Absolutely. Well, you know, we, we wish you Godspeed and uh, hopefully, you know, you'll come back and, and join us again. And, and listen, I'm glad we were able to schedule you because I suspect as the months and years unfold, your 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 dance card is going to try to pull you out of the classroom and out of the library <laughs> a lot more as people realize, hey, we need to go get the Enigma Clarence Thomas. This is, where we, this is the this is the ideology and intellectual work that is, is informing the state. But we want to thank you for joining us today, uh, Professor Robin, and uh, please come back. All right, thank you very much, and I'd be happy to do it. I really enjoyed it. Thank you so much. We'll be back in a moment to clear the table here at the Black Table on the Black Star Network. Back in a moment. Hi, I'm Dr. Jackie Hood Martin, and I have a question for you. Ever feel as if your life is teetering and the weight and pressure of the world is consistently on your shoulders? Well, let me tell you, living a balanced life isn't easy. Join me each Tuesday on Black Star Network for a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. We'll laugh together, cry together, pull ourselves together, and cheer each other on. So join me for new shows each Tuesday on Black Star Network, a balanced life with Dr. Jackie. In 1950, when Carter Godwin Woodson passed away here in Washington, D.C., at the age of 75, W.E.B. Du Bois wrote his obituary in a small journal called Masses and Mainstream. You heard Professor Robin mention Herbert Aptheker, who you would think would be the last person that Clarence Thomas would cite, uh, the, the Marxist historian, but that was a journal that, uh, that Herbert Aptheker actually published in as well. And this is what W.B. Du Bois said about Carter G. Woodson, he said, the life of Carter G. Woodson shows what race prejudice can do to a human soul and what it is powerless to prevent. The whole time we were listening to Professor Corey Robin, that quote from Du Bois echoed through my mind because the life of Clarence Thomas in some ways shows us what race prejudice can do to a human soul and mind and what it is powerless to prevent. And so as we clear the table today, I'm reminded of the song by Jeffrey Osborne, the LTD, where did we go wrong? If we got to start again, then perhaps as Jeffrey Osborne reminds us, it doesn't matter who is right or wrong. It doesn't matter who's to blame. We both have to swallow our pride and make this love strong. If you take love out and put country in, maybe we got a shot. Or maybe Clarence Thomas may be on to something. Either way, we got a front row seat to see what happens next. Join us next week here at the Black Table and support the Black Star Network. We'll see you next week.